Um, my name is Phil. I work at SoundCloud in our Berlin office. Um, SoundCloud has offices in Berlin, that's our headquarters. We also have a fairly big office in New York these days and a very small office here in San Francisco. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today is really about how, yes, it's about how we use Finagle at SoundCloud, but it's more about the motivations for us to, to use it the way we do and even to come up with the idea of using Finagle to begin with. So first, um, because you know, it's, it's, I, I kind of know some of you we, we talked about, but I don't know if, if you all know what SoundCloud is. Um, SoundCloud is the largest repository of audio online. And I know what you're thinking now, it's like, what, what do I mean largest? You know, there's, there's all these other streaming services and various different things. Don't they all have the same catalog? Maybe not Taylor Swift, but hey, you know, about the same stuff. And yeah, this, this is true. Uh, but SoundCloud is a bit different because SoundCloud doesn't have just the major catalog. We have all sort of, all sort of different content and because we let users upload the content as well, so have user-generated content. So at SoundCloud, this is just a random assorted pick of my own likes and people I follow. You're gonna find uh, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Foo Fighters, some Brazilian singers I really like, NASA and you know, our offspring, all sort of different things. In SoundCloud, we have literally from Skrillex to the sound of bats having sex. And to me, they sound absolutely the same. Uh, also, some people, some people accuse us of inventing or at least broadcasting dubstep. I hope that's not true. Um, but yeah, so we have, we have all this interesting kind of different content. And what that means is that we have about 11 hours of audio uploaded every minute. And we, we get visited by about 300 million, 300 million people every month. I'm really nervous with a microphone like this because I'm Brazilian and I use my hands a lot. So I feel like I, so if I'm shaky a bit, don't, don't worry. Anyway, um, so one interesting thing and one interesting constraint about these numbers is that to us, every time a piece of audio is uploaded, it's not just making it online. We actually need to transcode, validate, clear for <coughs> copyright infringement and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a lot of work that needs to be done in under one minute. So it's, it's quite complicated. And in, you know, I don't, I don't want to tell the same story everybody tells, but just like everybody else, SoundCloud started as a Rails monolith. Um, very much like Twitter. I don't know how many times we actually had this story being told here today. Anyway, long story short, we kind of went like this, from a sacrificial architecture, you know, <laughs> code written by the founders in a dark room in Berlin, I'm not sure they were in a dark room in Berlin, but they were in Berlin, um, to microservices. There's lots that happen in this migration. There's lots of talks and articles published about this. If you're interested, just come talk to me later. Anyway, um, so we have services now. And <coughs> to be honest, to me, this name microservices, it, it's really complicated because it doesn't really mean anything. You know, there's books and articles, but I, I'm not too sure what that means. And um, so the way I, I like to think about it is that we have services. And some of these services are micro. Some of them are small. Some of them are bigger. Some of them are really big ass, like massive things. But the most important thing is that we have services. So one, one thing that um, is quite common, even though I don't necessarily understand what microservices mean, uh, means, the one thing that's quite common every time people keep talking about microservices, or every time I hear somebody talking about microservices, is that often these companies, these organizations have lots and lots and lots of services. In our case, we have, I actually just checked last night, we have about 100 services to 130 engineers, more or less. So this 130 engineers, this number is really interesting, uh, and I'll keep coming back to it. Because this is by design, and we, 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 have, we had our hyper growth phase where we hired 20 people a month. But that's not what we want to be, that's not what we want to do. We want to keep the team small as much as we can. Uh, we want to keep our culture, we want to you know, do other things, but just hire people to, to make sure we can deliver things. And obviously, this also comes with their own constraints, and that's, we are going to talk a bit more about this. 
So 100 services, 130 engineers. And there's one thing that I've learned in previous lives uh, in a service-oriented architecture, but also in these microservices, whatever it means, life, which is each service you bring up has a fixed cost. So every time you come up with something new, every time you create a new service, you have the cost of setting it up, monitoring, making it production ready, whatever, you, you name it. So if, 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 if you have 300 microservices, going, sorry, 100 microservices like this, each one of those is you incurring on this cost for each one of those. And this, this cost is a bit less, well, it's, it's harder to perceive when you have less services or maybe just one big monolith like we used to have because then you start treating these things like pets, right? So you have all this craftsmanship going around. You create the best build systems. You create the best pipelines. I actually think our, our monolith, which still exists, uh, we call it the mothership, um, it's, it probably has the most stable deployment infrastructure and the fastest and best, best really, uh, testing pipeline. Why? Because we've been developing these things for seven years. And people, uh, people pay a lot of attention in trying not to screw up these things because they know it's really hard to fix it after the fact. So going back to the microservice side, I, I, would like, I would like to talk about three different costs or facets of the cost of a new microservice. And Finego comes in in the last one, but the others also influence our decision to go with Finego. The first one is just cost of complexity. I don't, I don't have a better name for it, but the main part that somebody mentioned earlier today that when you have, it, it's like, when you have microservices, you just get all the complexity that you could have inside the monolith and kind of split all over your, your company maybe, uh, your data centers, whatever it is. And you need, to, you need to be really diligent and pay lots of attention on what you're doing because otherwise you end up with something like this. One of the reasons we end up with something like this and especially in our case, and that has happened in SoundCloud so many times, is that companies organized around microservices tend to be a bit more end-to-end -end with their teams. So say, instead of having a web team and a backend team, you may have a sign-up team or a growth team, or in our case, a playback team, recommendations team. And what happens a lot is that team A depends on something by team B, but they don't actually talk so much to team B. You know, maybe they are not even in the same building. Team B then depends on something on team C, and they don't realize that team C actually depends on something on team A back again. So this graph obviously is an illustration, but there's some circular dependencies here, which is the kind of stuff that actually happens a lot in microservice architecture. Uh, there's various interesting technologies in, that try to make sure you don't end up in loops like this. But it's really hard to avoid when you have, in our case, uh, I don't know how many teams you have, probably have more than 10 teams working on, on their own backlogs. One of the ways we, we found to deal with this problem at SoundCloud was uh, trying to layer down architecture a little bit. So what we've created is that, actually I just saw the diagram by Marius this morning and there was a very interesting variation of this kind of stuff and it was like going that way instead of going this way uh, and the names are different. But in the end, it's very similar. What we have is, at SoundCloud right now, is three layers. The first one called Edge Services, which is a name I think we stole from Netflix. Um, then we have a called Value Added and Foundation. And what's, what's this? Like, the, all requests come through here, and they go to something here, and probably something here as well. The interesting thing about microservice architecture is that it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to do anything hitting just one of these boxes, maybe not even hitting just two of them, right? You really need to go deep at least a little bit in your tree. And the way we, we think about this is services here, uh, they are required, they're absolutely required for every single request. They usually validate the request, they do rate limiting, they, I don't know, they, they do authentication, they do authorization, they must be up. The, the SLA for these guys is insane, and it must be real, real fast. Services in the bottom here, I think, I think it was called persistent or something in my slide. Uh, those are like services that usually have the interface that takes an ID and returns data, takes a list of IDs and returns a list of data. It's really like wrappers around a database. 
And these things are very stable. They don't change as much. But they, they must be, they also must have massive availability because there's no fallback. So if this thing's down, you don't have the data you need. There's no, there's no, there's no you know, um, workaround you can make. You don't have the data, you don't have the data. These guys in the middle, they are the vast majority of our services. Those are systems that <coughs> receive a fir a first a request from these guys, aggregate data probably from some of the, say, their peers and something from, from bottom layers and return a response. Oftentimes, these guys can actually have some form of fallback. For example, at SoundCloud, a classic one is, uh, what happens if I'm trying to display the play button for a track, and the play button has a little box that says how many likes that track has had. What if the like service is down? Well, it sucks for the like service, but this guy, he can just return zero, and that's OK. Or maybe, depending on what kind of, what kind of representation you're returning, you just omit that data, gray it out. Don't show that box. There's various different things that we can do. Organizing our system like this, um, where it is able to manage the situation a bit more without having to introduce a lot of bureaucracy. And just as an example, this is like completely uh, made up, but we could have like various different APIs. They call a user profile service, which then uh, goes to other fundamental service to. To, to render enough data to return the full user pr profile experience. This is pretty common these days in microservice architecture. Spotify has a very similar architecture. Netflix has a very similar architecture. But uh, it took us a very long time to get here. And, and, and this doesn't solve all the complexity. It hasn't solved all the complexity problem for us. It, it made everything better because now we can reason about these things, this architecture, just the same as you would like to layer your software. But it didn't solve everything. Another thing we've done recently uh, was to introduce what we call <coughs> services directory. Um, services directory is actually based in a, in, in a concept called humane registry. Um, if you're familiar with SOA from, I don't know, the 90s, uh, <coughs> sorry, the 90s, you will remember things like UDDI and crazy registry with a lot of XML. The idea behind the humane registry is a bit different. It focusing information that's accessible to humans. I had to, I, I actually couldn't sanitize this, so I had to put a lot of red bars everywhere to hide some host names of my security team would get really upset at me. Um, but this is, when you go to this system, you can, <laughs> there's a list of services. And if you go to a specific service, there's like 100 of those, right? You can see stuff like repository name, the URL, um, the description of the service, who owns it, with an email address. You can send page duty incidents to these things and all, all this kind of stuff. As you can see, was totally, uh, the, the UI was created by a developer, a back-end developer, because it sucks. <laughs> we are really, really trying to get some front-end people to help us here. Uh, at least, thanks to it for Bootstrap. Everything looks better Bootstrap, right? Um, but yeah, it's, we, we, we iterate on it. <laughs> I clearly would like to make this open source at some point. Uh, it's a bit too tied to our infrastructure right now, but at least the idea is helping us a lot. And that's one third step that has helped us a lot, uh, which is actually creating some policy around what technologies, what tech stacks, what languages we support. Um, at first, SoundCloud didn't really have any kind of guidelines around which language one could use or should use. Or I know, felt like using. We had everything you know, in our stack. And most recently, after realizing that, again, with 130 people, if somebody decides to do something in Haskell, this person is the only person who knows Haskell in the whole company. Uh, somebody's mentioned that um, leave, what, holidays policy in, Fran in France is seven weeks. In Germany, it's 22 days. Uh, and, but there's this one in interesting thing in the age group we have our engineers at which is parental leave. So parental leave in Germany can go to nine months, paid. So, you know, every now and then somebody disappears for nine months. And that was the only guy who knew Haskell. So what do you do? After various different instances of these problems, we kind of decided to nail down what we actually expected from people and what we would support as a company. So the theory is that um, Scala, and Scala was chosen because of Finagle, so it just kind of put in the cart in front of the, 
oxen or whatever this expression is like. Uh, I'm, I'm translating in my head from Portuguese. <laughs> but um, we chose Scala because of Finego, but the idea is that everything built in, in Scala should be a no-brainer. There will be support. We have lots of tooling. We have lots of um, documentation, everything for Scala. Things on the JVM uh, should be easy. These, these things are really wishy washy, no brainer, easy. What does that even mean? Uh, but I think they, they, they illustrate what we, we're trying to say. So they will be easy. And one of, the, one of the ways we make them easier than what it could be is even though we write all of our libraries and all of our tools for the JVM languages in Scala, uh, we write all the tests in Java. So this is a a hack, really, or a technique uh, we've, we've developed recently. And that helps us identify when there's something real bad we introduce in the system. You know, if, if you have an API that depends on implicits or something that's completely impossible to use from Java, uh, we know straight away because all of our unit tests are written in Java, so we have to go through the pain these other people would have uh, to go through. And building something else should be possible. This is the, even the most wishy-washy of them all. What's possible? Pretty much what that means that everything we build is based on standards that either can be implemented in any programming language we think of, like HTTP or JSON, or there will be uh, support through sidecars. Um, sidecars is an interesting concept. Netflix also pushed a lot for it, which having a small application deployed with your application. Um, so for example, if you have something in Julia, and Julia doesn't have support to distributed tracing, so instead of trying to bake that in in your Julia code base, uh, you can actually deploy a, a sidecar, an application um, using Finagle that then proxies requests to and from the Julia code base. We, we, we seldom do this, but you know it's possible. So this is this is three these are three different ways where we tackle the um, complexity cost. And then another one when it comes to microservices, and again. Think about, I think about microservices. The only real conclusion I can get to is that there will be a lot of services. And maybe in one month, we have 10 new services. And then next month, five of them will die, be merged, be split in 20 more. So there's a lot of setup. Every time somebody starts a new service, they have to set up something. And then there's this interesting thing that is the build.sbt file. So my theory about SBT is that first, we all know that S in SBT stands for the same as S in SOAP, right? This, this should tell a lot. But um, I think only, there's only like one build.sbt file I've ever written, and we've been copying and pasting and changing it. <laughs> and I mean, it's, yes, it's a joke, but at SoundCloud, it's pretty much the truth. We created one of these guys that looked exactly like this, and I remember the day that it was written. And since then, everybody copies and pastes the same stuff. Sometimes there's this check here for Java version, and the variable says it's Java 8, and checks for Java 8. Sometimes you see it says it's Java 7, and here it still checks for Java 8. <laughs> it's, it's insane. <laughs> and to be honest, after working for a while with SBT, I cannot blame those people. It's, it's not easy. And just remembering to put spaces here is like drives you nuts. Anyway, um, but come again. <laughs> Great, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I'm so afraid of it that I just press it <laughs> and then twice. Uh, so one one of the things we've done about this is actually instead of fighting with the two. I mean, to be honest, I, I know some people use other things to for Scala, but I. I've tried, and I don't think I, I still think SBT is the best you can get, unfortunately. But there's things you can do, right? For example, in our case, because we create so many of these projects, it was worth it to invest into building a plugin. So we actually here on the top. I'm really sorry, I can't read, but the slides are going to be up. Um, we have the same. I, I don't know if it's the same project exactly, but the, these projects are very similar. Using our SBT uh, plugin, we call it we call it our Java library or JVM library, JVM Kit. So you're going to see JVM kit everywhere. Um, and that, that reduced this big piece of stuff uh, to this. But that's not actually true. There's something here in the bottom that actually became really important to us recently. We call it a manifest file. It's a manifest.json file that lives in the root of every single repository. And what this file has 
is basic stuff like the name of the application, the runtime, so JDK 8. This uh, is well, there is a um, Docker image in our in our registry, in our internal Docker registry, with this tag, with this name. Um, some description: who owns it, uh, the status if it's production development, la la la, <clears throat> the type if it's a library or an internal service in this case, data sensitivity. Um, we operate under European privacy law, which is really, really interesting. Uh, and dependencies. So other systems you depend on. As you can imagine, the services directory I showed just before consumes from this guy. So the services directory itself, it has a database with just caching, because all information it actually shows you comes from these and, and other systems. So this small SBT file, and this becomes a build.scala, which I really prefer, because then I can use my ID properly. And this manifest file form everything we need to actually create a new application. This is also, the, the, as I was saying, the manifest file is really important to us because not only is used for this, but it, we found so many different use cases for it right now. Um, this file plus some tooling lets us export metrics to Prometheus. We're going to talk about a bit more about Prometheus later. Uh, let us set up. Um, rotation schedules and whatever they call escalation policies on patient duty, Jenkins pipelines, how to create Debian packages, Docker images, Isinga. Uh, if you don't know what Isinga is, if you hate Nagios, if you hate Nagios, raise your hand. Hands, check Isinga if you haven't yet. It's not the solution to your problem, but will make your life a little bit better. Uh, set up envi ephemeral environments at Amazon and all this kind of stuff coming from this file. So this file plus a bit of tooling has saved our lives so many times. Um, so OK, these are two interesting, uh, well, I guess one really, one, one interesting solution to the setup problem. After we adopted this, uh, getting, a uh, getting a project up and running, being deployed to production through a build pipeline, so a Jenkins pipeline, it went from like a day to, it still is one hour, and a lot of it is, <laughs> Because even with Docker and all this stuff, uh, we still have the problem of, you know, the, my, my, my biggest challenge right now is how to reduce the size of .iv2. That directory is my main problem, my nemesis right now. Anyway, it takes a while, but still much better than what it was before. But then now we come into, um, we're coming close to Finagle. So once. You know, I've, I was saying how you have all these different, you have to create all these different um, services, you have to set up them, you have to um, make sure your architecture kind of makes sense, is understandable. But given you have multiple services, you also need to make them talk to each other. And we had lots and lots and lots of um, different <laughs> presentations on this topic today. But um, going back to the SoundCloud case, back in the day, we had a little bit of a problem when we had multiple different programming languages and environments, which was we just had everything. I was saying, like, this is not too far away from reality. We actually had all these languages at some point. Um, Rails, I don't think we're always going to get, ever going to get rid of Rails. Twitter still has the Rails thing, right? Yes? No? No? So, there's four Rails things. <laughs> Four boxes left. That's pretty good. I still have a couple hundred. Um, <laughs> but we are getting there. I, if, you know, it's been only, only three years. Uh, so we actually we had, we started our JVM development with Clojure. We went way far. I'm, I'm kind of a list guy, uh, like converted to Scala. So I was pushing for Clojure. We had Java. We, have, we had Go. We have lots of people who really, really, really like Go as SoundCloud. Um, we also had people who were in the corner doing Haskell and we didn't really notice. Um, <laughs> we, we, had, we had all sort of stuff. And the worst thing about this, I mean, I, I, I'm an engineer and I'm, I'm like a big nerd. I love technology and I love all these things. Um, but when you actually have to get stuff to production, it's a bit complicated. Uh, and one of the problems these things uh, introduce is that it's always the minimal common denominator, right? What's the, what technology, what protocol, what stack I can use that all these things can, can talk, they all can talk to each other. And in this case, it was pretty clear, it was HTTP plus JSON. Um, so since forever, 
We've been using HP plus JSON with all these things. We've developed our own internal standards with headers you use to broadcast user ID, authentication information, and whatnot. But the reality is that we could not get rid of it. To be honest, when we first started doing these things, I didn't really mind. Um, I spent a lot of time in a company called ThoughtWorks that some of you may have heard of, where people who wrote the RESTful in practice book used to work as well. And I spent way too much time with those people. Uh, so I was like, yeah, REST. Let's go all the way REST. REST is the solution to everything. Anyway, uh, so we are, we are doing our services. Everything was good. But even, even, in, even if you have standardized everything in Java or Clojure or Scala, uh, there was one thing that was still not great to us. What, this is kind of the typical flow for so many of our services. Uh, first, you go to somewhere, say, the search server. No, hang on. I keep, here is like, get IDs of all tracks for an artist. So I go to the Skrillex. Oh, I, I want to check out tracks by Skrillex. I go to the tracks system, send in Skrillex ID, receive back a list of IDs. Typical, right? And then for each of those ID, I get the track metadata uh, because one thing you start learning working at SoundCloud is that each music has from seven to 10 owners, each piece of music. And depending on the geographic region, they change. So we need to check out what's the permissions for this track in this territory today, uh, which is a really complicated logic. So we go get this. And because you're a social platform, we might as well just get all comments for that track. Um, you know, people comment a lot on different tracks. So we do this for each track return a list to client app. Who does something like this in the app? Hands up. So this is n plus one problem, right? It's like we've, it's, it's just computers. That's what they do. Uh, but the main, everything, especially coming from Rails, uh, Rails being not very good at doing more than one thing at the same time. Uh, we always done this very linearly and takes forever uh, to process a list. And what we've identified is that there was obvious, uh, uh, not problems, because I'm a manager now, so I have to say challenges. Obvious challenges, opportunities for improvement here in the sense that once you have this list, you can send each of, if you have enough processors, being threads or CPUs or whatever, units of processing, I can send each element of this list of IDs to be processed in, in parallel. Once they are into this processor, I actually have three different tasks here that I can use some concurrency to take advantage of. And if you disagree with my <laughs> usage of concurrent and parallel in this track and you think that's wrong, please tell me what's the right one because those concepts confuse the hell out of me all the time. But what I mean is that this can be made much faster. So OK, uh, we, we, we understand that. That can be made much faster. But what should we use? What's the, what, what's the industry standard around that? Remember, we are. Back then, we were even less than 130 people, but we have at least one fourth of the staff of other competitors. We do not want to be building infrastructure ourselves. So we go to the market, and we check out what's, what's in there. The first thing that you know, we, we, we hit was uh, the Netflix stack. And one of the reasons, because you know, media company, media company, maybe. I'm sure a lot of what we do, they do very similarly to various different things. And what we stumbled upon, unfortunately, was something like this, which is not really this, because these I copied from the documentation page two or three days ago. Um, it was something very different, but just very similar at the same time, which is a shitload of callbacks. Uh, this is, I don't know if this is reactive, because reactive is like microservices. I don't know exactly what it means. Uh, but every time I have a code, I have some piece of code with so much callbacks and reactions, I feel like it's when you're having a fight with your partner and they start throwing things at you and they throw the cat and like, oh, the cat, I get the cat. Oh, throw the plate, no, the plate, I dodge. It's like, it's too much stuff happening at the same time. I don't know how to pay attention to this. And obviously, being Java without lambdas, I don't even know just what lambdas suppose they do, but this is like from this week, so I don't know. Um, it was just like, mm. <laughs> I'm not sure about this. Don't you love when it's public void, the, like the wrapped type void calls? <sighs> anyway, uh, that works for lots of people, but uh, it didn't work for us. And then we finally, some people who had, worked, who had, who had been to my, in my team, were in different teams, had tried Finagle before, like probably, a, I don't know, the first versions. 
didn't really like it. But we decided to you know, take a look anyway. Uh, we found this kind of stuff uh, on, the, on the documentation page. And I have to say that whoever wrote this, you're in the wrong team, you should be in marketing. Because this looks clean and nice and understandable, and there's lots of ellipses here and there and there. <laughs> And they're like, but you know, I can relate to this. It's like, yeah, cool, I'll, I'm gonna use this. Uh, and that's kind of what happened to it. So we, we first started uh, building our first uh, API out of the monolith in Finagle. Um, we, had, we had actually a great time. It was it an was, um, interesting challenge because it was our first API in seven years. That was not the Rails API, uh, but no, it was fun. But obviously, it had a lot of problems with some, well, some, some people are just not happy. For example, this email that's almost for a button from somebody who was on the team. Like, that said, my overall critique of Finego is that, la la la, a lot of published implementations are exceptionally complicated for the problem domain entail a bunch of onerous transitive dependencies. I'm not a native English speaker, and I always had a problem with this person. Like, big words, complicated. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this onerous language uh, means that, you know, it's too complicated, too many dependencies. I have to agree with the too many dependencies bit. I don't know, I don't know if you guys share this, this feeling, but uh, yes, there's lots of dependencies. But, you know, we had lots of conversations and email threads going forever. But one interesting thing about how we adopted or why we adopted Finego is that, remember the, the number of programming languages and different things we had? We're actually trying to convince all those people to adopt a single programming language and a single tool set. This wasn't easy. Uh, people come from different backgrounds. Some of them hadn't seen a JVM in 10, 10 years since they left school. It, it was really complicated. And, but ultimately, one thing that helped us um, understand and actually create some com commitment from the whole company to go ahead with the decision to use Finagle was the Finagle model. I actually think the paper came after we had adopted Finagle. Uh, I don't actually remember. But it doesn't matter because what the important thing here is that, just like Marius was saying this morning as well, um, there's only three things you actually need to understand to understand Finagle. Future, service, filter. Everything else kind of derives from it. Yes, there's lots of details. Yes, service discovery can be really funny. Yes, you know, there's all these different things. Uh, but in the end of the day, if you, if you get these three concepts, uh, you, you know how to model systems. You, you know how to build systems using Finego. One thing that we've done uh, is that we put aside a team of, um, actually you have two people, uh, which is our libraries team. Uh, and this, this team actually tries to encapsulate as much as the complexity as we can. Because a lot of our people, you know, it's an iOS developer who wants to build API because she wants to access that data, but she doesn't want to spend any more time on backend land than she actually needs to. Because you know, the, the value of her work is actually on creating the iOS interface or whatever uh, other um, interface it is. So if you get these three concepts and you start building your systems like uh, the paper keeps talking about, you, this actually shapes your mind. It's, it's a really interesting, uh, really functional, if you will, a way of thinking about things. And it turns out that it's not that hard to implement, at least it's in our experience. For example, we have this thing called the request validator. It's not really called a request validator, but let's call it the request validator. Which is every request that hits the system uh, needs to meet some checks, right? We need to make sure that, oops. We need to make sure that uh, we have authenticated the request. We, again, I was, I was saying just, just before how complicated music is and each geography has a different owner. So we need to know where this request is coming from. I need to know it's under rate limiting, which features are available and all the circumstances and all the stuff. We had this kind of logic forever. We always had it. Uh, and as you might imagine, in Rails, it's implemented as one very, very, very long if. And it's the one class you really don't want to touch. And you have to have now and then, for example, only recently we introduced rate limiting. So you have to go open a class. First thing that happens, Emax crashes. We're like, open a class again. <laughs> Maybe try Vim. Go for it. Find that one piece of code to add another condition to Dave. And you know, run your integration test. Yeah, sure. Pretty sure it will work. And oh my god, it's such a rate limiting. How do I even test rate limiting? Anyway, eventually you get there, but it takes forever. You may take this height down twice. 
That's not great. And you can do, uh, even though I keep bashing Rails, you can do exactly the same in any programming language, right? And that's what a lot of people do, in fact. But following that model, uh, it gave us a different, different way to think about this problem, which is just a pipeline, right? It's like the Unix way, as people keep saying all the time. It's pipes and filters if you're into design patterns. Uh, we just implemented these things as separate filters that compose in one way or another and take you to the actual, uh, actual feature. Actually, some of these, fil these um, filters are also used in different parts of the system, so we got some reusability as well, and it's great. In fact, lots and lots and lots of what we do these days is just implement these filters. This is just con command N on my IntelliJ, and you know, there's, there's filters for everything from business rules to uh, air breaks, circuit breakers, cores, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff in here. So that was good. Um, like, it was an interesting side effect of choosing Finagle. It wasn't really the reason we chose Finagle, but having all these, pi um, these pipes and, and services, it's been, it's been great. Um, but in the end, we came here because of performance. And we don't have the luxury of having a lot of people with experience in backend development or trying to, uh, we, we are talking, there was a session earlier today where we were talking about uh, tuning of JVM. And what happens in SoundCloud is that somebody tunes the JVM, everybody else copies whatever settings it was, irrespective of what your system does. If it's the same or not, just keep copying, keep copying. You know, this person knows more than I do. This happens a lot. So we needed to find, we, we needed this framework, whatever the framework would be, uh, to provide good enough um, performance for people who are, to be honest, not experts on it. They're experts in different things. They're not experts in, you know, server side. Uh, concurrency or whatnot. And to be honest, Finagle totally delivered on that. This is a recent uh, span. This is totally not uh, optimized. It's exactly, I think you can shave off at least 30% of what this is doing. Um, but this is a screenshot of our Zipkin. And you can see this thing's talking to 10 different services, has 42 spans, so how can I describe a span? 42 bars. Uh, and goes three levels deep. We try not to go too deep in our microservice architecture. Three to four, four um, steps is kind of what it is. Uh, and can still deliver 92 milliseconds. Written by somebody who barely knows any Scala, you know, who, who keeps going between IntelliJ and uh, the Scala school or whatever, whatever um, Scala documentation they're using. So that's great. But as I was saying, there's still some, some challenges, challenges. Uh, on this, and one thing that I've learned is that I, I came to I came to work for SoundCloud after four years spent in, in the other company, thinking REST is always good enough. Screw you! Like seriously, REST is always good enough. You're doing it wrong. You're doing. I'll get I'll get your book, very good book. Oh, the PhD thesis. Go for it. And turns out that <laughs> after a while there, I was like, eh, not sure. The first thing is. I had this, uh, this deep belief, I really, really, there was something that was my religion. And if you had a good enough API, you need no client. You need no client like specific to the application. All you need is a HTTP client, you follow the links, la la la, you're done. Um, well, after a while, uh, what we realized is that across all of our multiple different microservices, we are writing the same code over and over and over. We would get a JSON representation from this URL, we would transform in this kind of class, then we would move there. And then we would send it back to the service this way, we would get these and these and these attributes. Because, you know, people don't want to do the same stuff over and over and over again. Teams just got together, created another project on GitHub, and dumped all the client codes they had there. So these are like clients for every single service we have, pretty much. And some of them updated four months ago, some of them a day ago, and keep, these things keep evolving. So effectively, we were writing client code like over and over and over, so much that people got sick of it and just created a library just for that. So they're maintaining a library just, to write, just with client code, something that could be totally automated. Uh, but speaking of not using HP plus JSON, Eventually, we decided to go for um, Thrift Max, uh, which we actually, I was here, I was talking to, to Travis and the other guys from uh, the Collabs team on, we were still 
debating if we, if we should try to implement protocol buffers on MUX or if we should go for Thrift MUX. In the end, we decided to go with Thrift MUX because we didn't have time, we had this project to deliver. The same excuse everybody gives. Um, and, but anyway, we, we recently migrated to, to Thrift MUX and I was saying that there was, you know, those 92, 92, 92 milliseconds could be shaved off. We have some really interesting examples of this happening as we migrate services to Thrift. And this is one of them from last week, I think, uh, where we, these are two instances of the same service. It's the same code base, exactly the same code base, both, of, both the Scala, both uh, um, Finagle, same version. I just like, the red one is responding on HTTP, the, the, the green one responds on, on Thrift Max. This is CPU usage, and that's when we shift from, H, we shift the clients from using the HTTP interface to uh, the Thrift interface. So you can see like massive, massive, massive uh, drop in CPU usage. And we had to estimate that 20% of our CPU time across the whole of SoundCloud was actually being spent in JSON and HTTP. And I mean, we are not Facebook where if you save 0.1%, you save, I don't know how many million dollars, but seriously, this is a lot. And actually, after looking at this graph, I think we're being optimistic. I think it's more than that. I think we are wasting way more CPU than we thought we were going to, or we were. So as I was saying, we use, we try to use as much as possible whatever is default. We don't want to build infrastructure. We're not in the infrastructure business. We're not big enough. We have a really, really tough problem to tackle ourselves. We don't need to get new problems to solve. Uh, but there are some places where we don't use the defaults. Some places where uh, we do something a little bit different from some other people using Finagle. One is service discovery, where we use DNS. <laughs> Uh, so we use uh, SRV records. So if you don't know the difference, this is uh, just a, um, a dig dump from, from a, a bind server. So this is a memcached disk, right? You see the A records here? So this is probably the DNS most people know, uh, where if you ask to resolve memcached D to dot ephemeral, you get this back, just IP. But uh, with SRV records like these ones, if you ask for memcached D dot ephemeral, you get some, well, it resolves to a name, but it could be an IP, I guess. But also returns a port. So with these two things, obviously, you have service discovery, right? I can find the server, I, can, I know which port I'm talking to. Um, the decision to use SRV records was actually made by our then infrastructure team. Uh, actually, it was the same person who wrote the email. I just thought about that. Uh, and this, so it was already there, and there was no point in fighting with, um, with, with our infrastructure teams for, you know, to get anything different. Uh, everybody was extremely scared of Zookeeper for some reason. I asked, they no, they have never run Zookeeper, but they were still scared. Um, so we, we actually wrote some code, and we are still using SRV records for, in DNS for service discovery. Actually, it works okay. Uh, what we do is that we don't use a JVM client. We have use an external client. We may make this code open source at some point. If helps people, I don't know. Um, but we are probably going to keep doing this for at least a while. We, funny enough, we do have Zookeeper now, uh, but we use it for feature flags and rate limiting, not for, not for service discovery. Another thing that we do a bit different is that uh, SoundCloud has decided to make an investment in a monitoring tool, no, yeah, a telemetry tool, uh, called Prometheus. It's on Prometheus.io. Um, I recommend you check out, it's a, it's a brilliant piece of technology but one thing we've done is that, given the manifest uh, that I showed you before, we can actually generate something like this, a dashboard, automatically for you, for, for your application. And this has like a uh, number of status code of each kind returned and open connections, HA proxy, response time, blah, blah, blah. Lots of interesting metrics on a dashboard, um, like, you know, available to you without much effort. One interesting thing is that we are trying to standardize these dashboards. So you can have, you can actually, it doesn't show here, but you can fiddle with these dashboards and change the date range or resolution, whatever you want. But we try to make it so that in a very known URL, it's like prom dash slash the name of your system, there's always a dashboard like this, exactly the same as for every single service. Uh, this is extremely important for us to compare two different services when something bad's happening. Um, it, it can get really confusing. 
And the kind of last thing we do differently is we don't use Twitter server. Um, we developed in parallel, I think before Twitter, service, uh, Twitter server was made open source, uh, something very similar in, the, in terms of admin endpoints. So every time you start your service, it binds to a second port, it binds to one port to respond to requests, it binds to a separate port to, uh, for admin functions. And this is very similar to an extent to what's on the Twitter server. Uh, the difference we have, we use secret breakers heavily, so there's a, our SREs were really, really, really strong about having something to uh, control the secret breakers, like open them or close them all. Uh, another one, because we use DNS, and because DNS details are not the nicest thing on earth, another point to refresh DNS, which is like the emergency button you press when things go to shit. Drop or open connections, this is the real emergency button. It's like, just, just forget about everything. Uh, and to control feature flags and various different things. Um, slash metrics is a Prometheus thing. You can configure Prometheus to go to a different URL, but we decided to go with vanilla configuration. So we have a slash metrics thing. Um, yeah. So um, there's another thing that we do differently, but that's, that's because we, we don't own the life cycle of Finagre, right? As you, we had also had this conversation this morning talking about life cycle and roadmaps and different things. Every, I don't know, two to three weeks, so I don't actually know uh, how often a new version comes up. And we were having a lot of problem keeping up with uh, the new versions. Even, even if they're not so frequent, even if it's not once, once a week there's a new version, uh, we had no way to actually test the, the, if the version was going to break something. At least like really, really bad break something. We had cases where applications would not start. I don't know what we were depending on. Um, after, so the usual procedure would be, we would then get to one of our applications, uh, get that application to run JVM kit for, sorry, run the new version of Finagre for a while. It's really complicated being in Europe and having so, so much of our user base in the US because you know, the time you're leaving the office is the time you guys are waking up. So we need to let it go for a bit. Uh, our rule of thumb said let it run for one week, see if something bad happens. Um, but we are trying to reduce this because it's obviously very wasteful and requires a lot of manual work. So what we're doing now, we're investing more and more in just integration pipelines. So this is uh, JVM Kit, our, our um, internal library, which uh, depends on Finagle. We just keep adding more and more integration tests for our own stuff, like our own service discovery thing, which is DNS, our integration with Prometheus, our integration with MKHD. Uh, these things, like this is probably outdated. There's probably, I don't know, three or two more of those. Uh, but this, this is exactly it's paying off the investment on this. Now we, we're spending much less time worrying, oh my God, is something going to break in this version? You know, somebody's application is not going to react well because we're, we're at least covering the integration points. Next step, we actually want uh, to build all of our services with this snapshot that we push here. This is not that far away uh, for us. We're investing, we're, we're making kind of an interesting investment in continuous delivery and continuous deployment tools right now. But I, I have to say, it's totally paying off. It's insane that there's not enough of good tools out of the box around this area. But the more we invest on this, the more we get out. So yeah. Um, in the end of the day, not only not using, using Finagre, which is like using Linux, right? You don't control uh, the Linux kernel, but for example, if you've been using uh, Debian and if you've been using Docker for a bit, you probably have had a lot of problems until you finally managed to migrate everything to Jesse. It's, it's the same problem we have. Uh, every time we depend on open source software, you're gonna have these problems. And you just have to find a way around it and find, make sure that you're part of the community and, participate, take part on it. Um, all right, so I think I am exactly much quicker than I thought I was going to be. So uh, anybody has any questions? <laughs>